And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a couple newcomers to the temple. The p two parts of the double-headed monster that is Apotheosis Studios, coming out with the with the successful with the um successfully funded even though the even, even though I don't think it's finished yet um warlock themed campaign the red opera on one hand we have Jameson Stone and on the and on the other hand in the blue corner we have David Granjo how are you how are you two doing today man oh you're yeah. doing fa fabulously absolutely doing really well fabulously. <laughs> yeah. so one of my traditions that I always have with these is to open with the humble beginnings, in a sense. So, walk me through your first introduction to role-playing games, and what was it that made it stick? Absolutely. So, my, my first introduction to uh, role-playing games, I was in grade school, <clears throat> and I had a wonderful babysitter whose boyfriend um, was a huge gamer. And he had, I remember looking up to him so amazingly, and um, he had a bunch of D&D campaign books um, and, and, and a bunch of other um, even non-D&D non, non uh, specific uh, lore books as well. And he did a lot of uh, LARPing. And this was in uh, New England. I grew up in New England. Mm -hmm. And there was a, a group called Nero. And so they would dress up in these foam armor. You know, we'd have um, these padded swords. And I would be able to, you know, put on his, you know, way too big armor for me. And we would just, you know, hit each other with these foam swords as we would run around LARPing. So that was my first introduction. And then as I got older and, you know, went to junior high and um, started playing games myself, I played a lot of uh, World of Darkness games. So Mage of the Ascension, Vampire the Masquerade, uh, played a lot of Shadowrun as well. Um, and after that, I, I, I just kind of found out, you know what, I'd, I'd love to love to have this be an integral piece of my life. And, um, you know, now here as, uh, you know, the creative director of Apotheosis Studios, I have the, the, the privilege and honor of being able to make these games and hopefully inspire a whole nother generation of gamers. And you, you, David, how did, how did you get started? Actually, for me, it was really recently. Uh, it was actually in the beginning of the, the Red Opera because um, um, I, was, I was born in, in, in Europe, in, in France, mm -hmm. and uh, I'm still in, in France. Um, and, uh, but my, all my education was done in Portugal. And in Portugal, the place where I lived, we didn't had a lot of access to uh, D and D books. It was the the typical like um, Monopoly games, you know, uh, those kind of games, uh, and then like usual the usual video games. Um, and I was, I think, when we start, it was when you start the Red Opera that Jameson, when he he. He came with the, with the idea to do this project. Um, it's it really took like a month for me to really understand how um, by by going to stores, buying a couple of uh, D and Ds, uh, talking with people around me, uh, talking with with Jameson in the team, um, and really understand how this is this this plays. And now I'm really fascinated of how. I was never exposed sooner to this world, <laughs> right? Um, and and sur actually surprised um, because here there's a lot of resources and a lot of stores only dedicated to to D and D. I was so fascinated by getting to know this world, and now with the Red Opera, I really want to like get more into it for sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And David's been a huge, huge video gamer for many, many years, and and that that's one of the the main focuses of our studio as well. And we're working on a project called Shadow of the Moon, and have been for many years. Uh, that's a uh, graphic novel and um, indie video game. And so, uh, mm -hmm. for us to be able to take the art style of kind of a AAA indie video game studio and apply that to Dungeons and Dragons um, and more of a, you know, fifth edition style, open-ended um, RPG setting, a tabletop RPG setting, um, I think really adds a very unique artistic perspective to the work that we're doing that you don't see in a lot of other E5 uh, books and, and campaigns and settings. Yeah. Now, 
within within the video game part is that is is always going to be interesting to me because um it's funny that a few decades ago there was there was this the idea of um integrating video games into tabletop was um ver- was very frowned upon in a, in large swaths of the uh, community and that's significantly changed over over the years um you get well to you to use an example i remember, i distinctly remember people lamenting that um third edition was being turned into diablo which um if you know if you know your history with D&D and Diablo is completely hilarious. <laughs> yeah. Um but with that with that in mind, talk to me about the origins of the of the Red Opera um project. How did how did it come about? Was it a case where it was a, a campaign setting that you had run in the past and decided to make into its own book or was there a different path? Yeah, totally. And, and, and I'll address really quickly as well. So for us, Red Opera really is just a, uh, it's, it's a pretty cut and dry um, campaign and setting book. And mm-hmm. now with our stretch goals, we're actually building it um, hopefully into the definitive warlock guide, uh, both for players and uh, game masters slash dungeon masters. Um, so the, the, the influences, <clears throat> excuse me, that you'll, you'll see um, from the video game genre will be more in kind of art style. Um, and so that will be, you know, we use a blending in some you know 3D animation, uh, a lot of Photoshop, um, using you know Dad uh, Daisy and, and a bunch of other um, really premier and cutting edge um, you know 2020 technology that uh, you know wizards and other game companies just don't have access to or, or choose not to use. Um, so this is you know strictly strictly a D and D book. Um, there's there's no no real video game overlap at least not yet. Who knows? Maybe someday in the future. Mm-hmm. So uh, the Red Opera came about actually um, with Rick Hines. He's our lead writer on the project um, and, and one of our one of our team members at Apotheosis Studios um, and Drake Mephesta, who is the frontman um, manager and um, uh, you know lead lead singer um, of Diamorte, a heavy metal uh, rock band, uh, an operatic um, rock band uh, based out of Chicago. Um, both Rick. Um, Drake and I think also um, a couple of the other band members were um, in Rick's um, uh, apartment, just kind of hanging out. Um, I think it was like a Friday night. I'm sure you know, drinking drinking some whiskey or something, and just kind of you know talking about gaming and and um, you know and enjoying good good geeky stuff. Um, and they saw a copy of our last book, uh, Apotheosis Studios' last book, uh, The Last Amazon, um, sitting on rick's um counter i I don't know if it was his coffee table or up kind of up on his nerd altar uh where it is now um and they were talking about uh this campaign uh that they had conceived of called the red opera um and the red opera um is based off of this very operatic um kind of larger than life um tragedy you know war love story um which it is now and has been built into now mm-hmm. um but that was found originally in diamorte's second album by the same name the red opera mm-hmm. um and so through the course of the evening um they along with with rick hines the lead writer of this project um, really crafted this idea of wow, you know, we can take this this story that we've created, and we can work with um, Jameson and David at Apotheosis Studios to turn this into something um, truly magnificent. Um, and so we then all, and this was gosh, probably a year and a half ago. Um, we all kind of came together and brainstormed how we could take this kind of rough idea that they had had at the time and then build it into something much larger. And Rick Hines, uh, again, the lead writer, um, did a really fabulous job along with Pat Edwards, another one of our writers, into, uh, and he did a lot of our um, uh, campaign and um, uh, encounter uh, setting and design um, to turn this um, from just kind of a story concept into this full fledged um, campaign and setting. Uh, we now then, with the help of other writers, um, some some of whom are actually relatively well known in the industry, um, with our stretch goals into turning it into into the Warlock um, definitive guide. Uh, so that's kind of the, the the basis of of how this all came to be. Now, I remember I remember um, seeing Warlocks in early, <clears throat> in earlier editions, and um, they were they were kind of relegated to the back burner. Um, 
and with or the enemies the too. Yeah, completely. Yeah, they almost seem like the bad guys, and that we're kind of retconned in. Like, oh yeah, if you want to play them as a character class, go for it if you want. Yeah, yeah they. There was the. I think the earliest attempt to try and make them into a viable character class was in um, was in third edition. And it was kind of seen as a poor man's uh, sorcerer. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Um, and I think um, in Pat Pathfinder, I think it may, I think it may have touched on warlocks, but um, it was ba it was barely a pittance at that point. But fourth edition onward, it's it's kind of been brought into its own, into its own particular niche, so it doesn't step on the uh, toes of the uh, um, sorcerer. And what I was curious of, what I was curious about of, of all the classes to build a setting around, why warlocks in particular? Well, I think I think for the reason that you you just mentioned, you know, the the warlock class really hadn't been given a lot of attention. It, it hadn't been given a lot of love. And from a storytelling perspective, this this complicated relationship between a patron and their warlock is really very fascinating, at least to us and and the people who have backed our campaign so far, um, and and really just about almost any other player in GM. Everyone is very fascinated and interested by this very unique uh, storytelling and, and 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 game device of you have this this patron um, who you basically you know, bequeaths you or, or, or gives you these these divine powers, but it's very different than a cleric um, whom, you know, this kind of radiates out this, this you know, these divine boons for you. For a warlock, you quite literally have to, you know, make a pact. You sign sign away either a piece of your soul or something else. Um, mm -hmm. uh, one of our uh, new subclasses that are, were, uh, I, we just unlocked, I believe, um, is the time warlock um and 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 in that you actually sign away aspects of of your own time whether it's your lifeline and um you know we can get into that a little bit later um but by giving giving parts of yourself for this divine power um it creates very interesting storytelling uh dynamics and f unfortunately uh how it's been done previously um that that relationship between patron and warlock you know we you know you'd be in a gaming session and things are you know you know running running smoothly and then it's time for the warlock to talk to his or her patron and everyone has to then sidebar um and it's it's been in a lot of ways uh, kind of similar to how they used to do um and this is a great example that rick hines um our lead writer uses um uh, i'm also a shadow runner um and uh, it's one of the things that Rick and I, um, you know, really enjoy kind of geeking out over a shadow run. Um, it'd be the same way for hacking. And so you'd have, you know, a hacker and they'd be like, okay. And then the GM and the hacker would kind of go off and they just kind of do their own thing for a little bit and then come back to the group. Well, we really want to actually bring that to the whole table and to the entire party. So in our campaign um, and in our setting of the Shadelands, anyone, literally any any character class, any any race, um, can have a patron, a temporary patron in this land. Uh, how how we've conceived it story wise and with the me mechanics of this game, are that here in the Shadelands, the 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 veil between worlds is much thinner, mm -hmm. and so you don't have to be a full on warlock. Uh, to be able to have a patron, you can create these temporary um, packs, and they can be open for other people to overhear. And some of them are not. You still have to sometimes, you know, step aside and you know, kind of have the have the veil come down and you know, do your cone of silence uh, GM session. Um, however, we really wanted to open it up to the entire table and have people run, um, even, you know, relatively high level classes, um, have them see what it's like, um, or high level characters, I mean, see what it's like to have a patron and, and, and have that kind of push and pull with the GM and, and, and try something really that's not been done before. So that, that was our impetus for um, why we wanted to do Warlocks. They're also just, I think, just really cool. <laughs> yeah. Now, <laughs> Get, now, getting into getting into that a a, a little bit further. Um, when it come when it comes to the when it comes when it comes to the um, patrons, um, maybe maybe it was just me, but it's it seemed that there was a vibe that the that um most of, that the most common form of patron are think within the setting are things outside. Is that the is that the case, or was or was that just um, a result of the selection that I had that I 
had access to at the time. Yeah, so I think that a, a lot of how that'll come down is how how a, a you know game master slash dungeon master wants to run their campaign. Mm -hmm. So patrons are this really interesting thing. You can have the old ones. You can have you know those the the plane walkers. You know those from Beyond the Veil. There's there's really like this is a storytelling device where you basically can have like a nameless Elrich energy entity who has you know maybe doesn't even understand the mach machinations of human um, even potentially human consciousness, but is able to give you a boon. Or you can have something that is you know. Some sort of like spirit of the forest, if you want. I mean, you can really go any any way with it. And so the beauty of this, you know, particular relationship is it's it's only limited by the creativity of the actual, you know, storyteller. Now, because warlocks had been such a neglected uh, class, I think that 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 things had almost become a little cliche and a little like tropey almost, where they were just like all like. Elrich horrors or you know Lovecraftian tentacle monsters, um, which are still cool. Don't get me wrong. Um, we we have plenty of that in our book as well. But that's only one subset of what some of these entities can be. Mm -hmm. For example, uh, Majin, who's one of the primary um, kind of protagonists um, and maybe antagonists of the story, um, he is this kind of the the, the personification of um, this like Elrich energy that as he embodies human form and it's even this this character is asexual. He just chooses is to, to come in as a human for this particular um, uh, story arc, um, he's never had food before. He's never eaten, had had to have physical nourishment. And so he has kind of like a low-key obsession with food. And it's just this very interesting, um, and had, had never even conceived that it would have been a thing and doesn't understand it at all. Um, and so to be able to have that play out throughout the arc of the story as a patron's arc, and this is a patron made manifest in, in flesh in the story. Um, we're able to really play around with that dynamic of what 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 are patrons? Where do they come from? What are what are the possibilities? And to give that foundation to to GMs where they then can make their own patron. And one of our stretch goals coming up, I think it's the like two or three stretch goals from now is an entire fully fledged out chapter on patrons. So you as the GM can actually make your own patron and we'll have some samples of here are some really great, well balanced, balanced patrons. Here are some packs, here are some boons that you can use. Um, but like, this is how you can be educated as a GM and not that all ed GMs need this, but if GMs are not used to running warlocks and not used to creating patrons, um, you know, again, having this this resource is incredibly invaluable for them to then be able to craft an incredibly compelling patron for their warlock um, and also being able to work with the player who has created and rolled this character to kind of understand what they're looking for too and it's this really cool co-creative process where they can form form this relationship and form these characters together now I want I want to shift I want to shift gears a bit to to um, talk about the particular way that the book is presented, at least in the um, in, at least in the uh, pages that um, I w that I had access to. And the ma the main thing that I saw with it is, and obviously since it was brought it was brought up in the introduction, a bit a significant amount of um, Diablo influence. With the, with how the with how there's these different assorted sketches throughout the uh, book, almost like you're reading through somebody's journal. Was that one of the um, visual design goals that you that you guys had? Yeah, so this is a perfect question for David Granger, our lead artist. Um, we all love Diablo, um, Rick, myself. David, we're, we're huge fans of Blizzard and Diablo, and definitely have drawn influence. Um, but yeah, David, please. Please take it away. Give us give us some of your your design inspirations, uh, some of the Diablo inspirations, and some of your overall goals um, for the visual representation and the artistic direction for the Red Opera. Yeah, for um, for the the visual design of the book, uh, I think it came about when I was doing the the D and D uh, research, and I was talking to a friend that he, he was he's a huge fan of. Of cyberpunk, actually, he's impatiently waiting for that game, um, and he was really happy when he br I told him like, "Oh, I'm I'm 
I'm uh, working on a new project. It's a D&D book. <laughs> and while he was explaining to me, he had this book of Diablo called The Book of Cain. Mm -hmm. um, and I really found it interesting because it's just like side stories of the Diablo uh, lore. And they came with this really interesting design of sketch. I think it was like early sketches of of Diablo three, I, I I guess, um, and and then when we were designing the, the the pages and we were when we were defining the art style, we were leaning into this kind of sketchy um, sketchy style. Sketch, I mean sketch, not sketchy, sketched style um, with the, the like with paper textures that could look like like you said, like a journal, like somebody's journal. Um, and it was actually something that I was really looking forward to a long time ago, like to dive into a style like this, uh, and, and, and get into it. Um, because it's really interesting because for me being, being like kind of like a outsider, I could like bring the artistic part of like visually, uh, more into the triple A game style, um, and comic book. Uh, so I think it was a nice blend of of uh, merging these two worlds, which is a D and D with kind of like the art book styles. Um, so yeah, the, the 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 style came about with lots of reference from Diablo, um, also from another from Dark Siders too. Uh, Dark Siders was also a big influence because uh, I have a lot of art books here in my shelf. And Darksiders, God of War, I really like the, the the influences that that was were brought into into the making of the the layout pages. Yeah. Um, to kind of follow to kind of follow up on that, um, the other thing that I did want to ask is on, um, is on is on the design of the particular maps. Um, now, along. It's funny that you mentioned Cyberpunk because I I do want to dip into that to that for a second because I don't remember when this was said but I remember a, at one point um, Pond Smith s said that he designed um, Night C Night City almost theme parkish and admitted to using um, Sim City um, <laughs> for par for a part of his for part of his map for part of the design of the uh, city layout. Um, when it came when it came to des when it came to designing the look of the Shadelands, were there any um, particular bullet points that you had that you had nailed down from the get go as far as what needed to be emphasized? Um, yeah, so the the Shadelands came about with our uh, environmental uh, artist uh, Carlos Osorio. And he he does a really great job by breaking down of how a city should work because um, it's also taking a a and it's also in in school like doing industrial design. He really understands like how um, form can follow function. Now the the way he designed it was was really by through after reading the book. And I think, uh, yeah, Rick Hines had a really rough sketch of Yonkarth at the time. Yeah, it was, it was, it was like <laughs> the the digital version of a back of the napkin sketch. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, but that sketch was super helpful for 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 Carlos to to create the city because he gave it, he gave him the the basics per se, um, and then he just had it to like to to populate in a realistic way and he done a very really great job uh of doing that because each chapter uh since it fleshes out more and more how the city looks he was able to um to build the city by by reading the book with that sketch um so yeah and i remember when we were starting to do the maps uh we he he he's he done it in 3d with a 3d software called blender and um uh, he 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 brought a lot of quality to it. So when we were like traveling around the city, it looked like almost Google Maps mm -hmm. uh, that we were traveling through Yonkath, like you travel on Google. 
Um, and then we were like, oh god, like just take a screenshot and we have like maps of, of different places. Uh, it was really doing the map search was really a a fun process to to see uh, flourish. Yeah, and and I don't I don't think that there's ever been um, at least not to this degree um, a a five e and four obviously uh, you know other editions either um, but a a, a fully fledged setting that's been designed in 3d before I, I may be wrong i i don't i don't know that 100 percent um but what we've created with the shade lands and young path is this dual city so there's technically two cities that's um divided by uh, this very large river mm -hmm. um and even the bridges across the river are their own places it's it's and that's where a lot of the organized crime in the city is and interestingly enough uh in, in young Cath and a patron city or dual city um the organized crime leader the, the 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 boss of of their version of the mafia is actually a cleric um and this cleric is trying to destroy all of the warlocks um which is hilarious so you have a cleric who is you know the the pit boss of of, of the organized crime of these two cities um pretty pretty hilarious in my mind um we we've, we've had fun with it and, and uh, rick hines the lead writer has done a really fabulous job um but by having all of these assets fully you know fully digitized, we're able to, 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 to really do a lot of unique storytelling things visually. And it's never been done before. And, and I think that as us, as millennials, um, you know, now we are in, in the professional scene, um, you know, as, as a you know, creative studio, we're able to leverage technology that, you know, Gen X and boomers had never had access to. Um, and even though they have access to now, you know, they're just, it's, it's, they're kind of behind the curve. Um, and so we're able to stand on their shoulders from a storytelling perspective, but be armed with a, a, a whole new arsenal of tools, uh, both artistic and even storytelling wise. Mm -hmm. um, and through collaborations such as Google Docs. And um, I mean, I remember even when I was first doing writing and editing, um, right as, as, as Google Docs started to kind of come online, you know, around 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15 years ago, um, to be able to have a collaborative document where you can have people from all over the world working on something simultaneously, um, you know, 20, 25 years ago, 30 years ago, that just wasn't a thing. Um, mm -hmm. So we feel incredibly fortunate to be able to work on these, you know, on this project now in 2020. Um, now, one of the things I saw, one of the things I saw in the um, story overview section of the uh, preview, was a bit of a diagram with each of the chapters and Ooh, associated. Hello. Oh. I, I think we've lost you. I think we lost him. Oh, sorry oh, about go. sorry about that. Um. We can hear you now. All right, so, sorry about that. That was a bit. Um, for some reason, my ping had sp I had spiked again. Um, but what what I was saying was saying is that when it comes to when it come, now you're going with um, unless I'm mistaken, you're going with ten chapters. So ten so ten core adventures and a a handful of associated um, side quests throughout throughout the campaign. Exactly. Um, yeah. And, and yeah. One of the questions that I have that I have on this, and I may have to explain this ter this term when I get to it, is: Would it be fair to say that the side quests are arranged in a kind of tiers and tent poles approach? Um, so I could, I mean, I could kind of hazard a guess of what you mean by that, but but maybe if you unpack that for me a little bit, I can a answer your question more specifically. Um, tiers and tent poles is so is something that I shamelessly stole. Um, stole from the, from um, Greg Weiss, the creator of Gargoyles, to that was the term that he used to explain how he did episode order because um stu because studios really hate um serialization, so his approach was here's episodes that you can put in any order, but only between these other episodes. Hmm. So so how we've how we've conceived of the red opera and how we've written it and how we've designed it um, from a both a very high level meta perspective and from a very nitty gritty player perspective and gm perspective is we wanted to create something that you could throw a pre-existing um any tier party so we're talking about level one to level 20 and you can I, i've i've heard 
you know, some people even tiering it for some of the, you know, expanded stuff beyond level 22. Um, that's outside of my, my skill set, um, both as a player, as a GM. Um, but uh, I've, I've, I've heard people have success with it. Um, but we wanted them to be able to run it at any, any tier of play. So what that necessit necessitated us to do was create these, these 10 um, acts each as story beats um, in and of themselves. And, and each act has three, three sections. Mm -hmm. um, and so, and, and it is our hope that, and people can do it however they like, um, that, that people will run a singular act in a, in a, in a set kind of play session. Um, and it kind of averages out to, you know, maybe around three hours, um, at, you know, per act, you know, an, an hour per, per, you know, beat within the act. Um, but some of these could take much longer and you could break it up and to have, you know, instead of 10 sessions, you could have 30 sessions if you wanted. It depends on how in depth you go into it and how long your sessions are. Mm -hmm. Now, you, you really can't run them out of order. <laughs> um, if you run those, if you run our, our acts out of order, um, it, it just, it, 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 it kind of falls apart. And we even have, um, you know, branching, you know, uh, branching endings, um, branch, branching quests, where if you do this, this, you know, particular avenue and your players, you know, lean the story this way, then go that, go this way with them. If they go this other way, you know, they go that way, then go that way with them. And we really lay that out for the GMs. Um, and we'd say, if you wanted to, if you as the GM want to take it this way, go, go this way with them. Um, what that also facilitates is, uh, how Having player agency really part of the story means you can r run it multiple times, uh, potentially with different character classes, potentially with different, um, you know, orientations instead of, you know, folks being like lawful good versus, you know, chaotic evil. They're going to make very different choices in the Shadelands. Um, if you play a cleric, for example, that, you know, potentially thinks that all warlocks are evil and need to be purged, that's going to be very different than if you play, you know, a druid. Um, you know, there these these unique, you know, perspectives will will greatly affect how how you navigate the city, and we wanted to really create space for that. Now, as far as the side quests are concerned, some of them you can totally bypass if you don't want. Others, however, you can play at any time. You can go to, you know, a specific location, get a specific quest quest and go do this, you know, very specific thing to get a very specific boon or reward. And that can happen at any any time during the adventure. Um, now, those are cool, but those don't really have a lot of influence on the overall story. They're really just kind of tacked on there as filler. And we have a couple of those, and they're very cool standalone adventures, and, you know, we're very proud of them. However, what we really wanted to focus on was value add to the overall story. So, for example, our current stretch goal um, is, a, is a very unique... Um, uh, or you know, I'm actually going to talk about our last our last spread stretch goal that was just unlocked. Um, so that one was a, a very unique perspective for our Evermore war Warlock, um, and that was a strictly level one adventure. Um, and in this adventure, everyone plays this wayward soul who's found themselves hoodwinked into a bad patron deal. And and this hoodwinking can happen at any anywhere on any of the many planes. And so people then have to these you know this this group um, comes together to try and get themselves out of this pact, um, and they then become caught up in this uh, quest to basically fix time itself in exchange for their freedom. Um, now this is a very particular um, intro quest into the, the Shadelands. So. For a GM who's trying to run this campaign with a group of, of um, new people, this can be a great way to bring this, this group in. Um, however, if a GM is trying to find a way to um, bring a new aspect of storytelling around this Evermore Warlock, this is a great way to give people a subclass of Evermore Warlock, specifically this Time Warlock. Um, and the, Ever War, uh, the Evermore Warlock um, subclass is a master of time manipulation. They're able to harness Elrich energies to study the intricacies of tempo and battle while serving patrons who punish those who meddle with time um, in extreme fashions. So anyone can start the game using this class. Um, and when they do, um, and, and when they go through this side quest, it then is unlocked for any character after completing 
the side quest. So we wanted to give people the option of, let's say they play a cleric, they play a fighter, they play a rogue, or they play a paladin, and they want to kind of get their feet wet, as it were, with some warlock um, subclass, they can run this very specific uh, quest to then get this this patron subclass. Um, and it, you can, you know, be able to run this at, at any level, but it's a really great intro into the world. Um, so I don't know if that 100% answers your question about uh, tent poles and, um, you know, that situation, um, but that's at least how we have conceived of um, our, our side quests and our, our, you know, kind of expanded, expanded story arcs. All right, I can, I can definitely go with that. Now, um, when it comes, now, when it comes to, when it comes to some, when it comes to some of the adventures, um, one now I'll, I'll get the obvious part I'll get the obvious part of this question because this is really going to be a two pronged one. The first is are there going are there going to be any chapters and you don't have to name specifics that are going to be using dungeon maps? Great question. So Rick Hines and I, and again, um he and I were, you know, kind of cut from some of the same cloth as we were coming up in the gaming world. Mm -hmm. A lot of World of Darkness, um, a lot of theater of the mind style storytelling. Um, so I love I love dungeon maps. I love minis. We actually have some amazing minis um, that were uh, custom created for us by Anvil uh, Custom Miniatures. Uh, they're uh, as, uh, uh, both as an add-on on our Kickstarter and part of some of our higher loot tiers. Mm -hmm. Absolutely fantastic. We have an unboxing video, uh, which I highly encourage people to check out. Um, as far as the actual dungeon maps themselves, we've had, we've had a lot of people ask us to create them, and we very well may as a stretch goal. Um, that's something that we saw as a supplement that we could always do later if there was enough like requests slash demand for it. For us, we really wanted to create a setting um, from this theater of the mind perspective where the GM would, would step up and craft this story, you know, part Lovecraftian, you know, part, um, you know, intrigue and, 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 and betrayal, um, almost like Macbeth meets, I don't know, Cthulhu, you know, kind of uh, craziness. Um, and uh, the actual like Dungeon Max kind of like, like, hex hex pieces um was was really something that we always knew that we could do or a discerning gm could also do on their own and we would be happy to work with them to kind of figure that out but we wanted to kind of put our big stones in in the the, the basket first and that was to make an incredibly um rich and and um vibrant world uh before we Kind of mapped it all out on hex pieces um and so we know that we've accomplished our goal and now with our stretch goals and with other supplements, we can always do additional, you know, uh, additional add-ons like like hex maps and things mm -hmm. like that. Now, for a bit of for a bit of a um, artistic question, um, one of the things I did one of the things I did notice is that if you mentioned earlier about using Blender, and I'm curious, I'm curious what the ratio of um, traditionally dra um, traditionally drawn or di or digitally drawn um artwork versus artwork that was created using using blender is in the full book oh yeah uh th there's actually no traditional medium in the book <laughs> um we we used we used a lot of uh blender was the main software that mm -hmm. we used blender in photoshop uh we had it a few third party softwares like um Des 3D, which we can uh, uh, get uh, uh, characters with their clothing, and we kind of like mix everything together, um, and then bring everything to Blender and 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 establish the scene that we need. Uh, to do many of the illustrations was done that way using Blender and Photoshop and Des 3D, uh, and many of the maps actually we 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 took the assets, the 3D assets that we already had um, to build, like some of the, to, to illustrate some of the buildings, we took those and kind of like play around with them, like mix and match them. Mm -hmm. um, it was really like a feeling of playground, you know, when you are a kid, you're in our, your sandbox playing with your toys, it was kind of that. Mm -hmm. um, 
and then we bring we 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 take a quick screenshot and we bring every everything to photoshop and then we photoshop filters like uh cut out filters like s some of the filters that you see in 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 instagram filters uh, to make like turn your face into a sketch like those type of things but then in photoshop we had like a more like handmade touch uh, we kind of fake that touch of traditional um and that's why we we that's how we are able to get this like result that kind of looks like traditional but it's not kind of it's not it's not traditional it's fully digital um and yeah those three softwares were the main ones used blender photoshop and that's 3d yeah mm -hmm. um so when, with some of the art with some of the art that's presented I was curious if you were doing some some um what in what came to mind for, what came to mind for me and this might sound a bit odd was um rotoscoping um with some with some of the with some of the um not with some of the artwork that looks a little bit like a sketch mm -hmm. um now obviously you obviously you're not using that exact same practice because Nobody's nobody's really done a whole lot of rotoscoping in the last few decades, <laughs> and I can bl I can probably blame the Lord of the Rings cartoon for that. Um, <laughs> it's def it definitely ties back into that whole um, motif that you me that you mentioned with the Book of Cain. Um, now, shifting into lore for a bit, you mentioned previously that um world of darkness was definitely an influence and this is where I, this is where i want to address something that's um a bit of a bad habit when it came to white wolf's books and i want and i want to i'm curious if this is a, this is something that you've um tried to avoid as best you could white wolf and subsequently onyx path have had a bit of a habit where they where they put a, where um they put a little bit too much emphasis on mascot characters, for lack of a better term. And while there's certainly going, while, while um, obviously characters like Do characters like Dorian, Fate, and Majin are going, and Lacroix are going to be important. Um, what has there been a conscious effort to make sure that they're not too important? Yeah. So. Obviously, when you have a, a cast of characters, um, you have to have the story propelled by by somebody. Mm -hmm. um, otherwise, it's just a setting, and then it's not a campaign. Um, and so, for us, um, you know, we we tried to create, um, you know, very compelling, uh, unique characters. Uh, so take take a, the Mad King, for example. Um, so the Mad King is a, a, a basically a, a storytelling trope that has been used through time immemorial. You know, you have someone with ultimate power who's a bit crazy, um, and chaos ensues. So we try to turn that on its head, and this is for Dorian, obviously the accursed king. We try to say, okay, so what would it be like if we had a, a, a person, a very charismatic leader? who saw a lot of young patrons getting um i, I won't uh, i won't use any profanity in 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 the monastery um but getting um we'll say screwed over um <laughs> by by some patrons and getting the the bum the bum bum end of it of a, of a patron's pact mm -hmm. um and within a, a warlock you know a warlock run um society um or not not even society but the city this mecca for warlocks um, patrons are, are genuinely or ge generally not not necessarily great. They don't have you. They don't have their 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 warlocks best uh, you know the best ideals in mind. Um, they're really very selfishly motivated, and so if they can get a get a very one sided deal, they'll take it. Um, at least how you know the, the, your average patient. And, and again, this is different than some of the deities in fifth edition uh, that would you know be more benevolent and and um, you know be more akin to gods. Um, some of them good, some of them bad. But you know your cleric class, you can genuinely trust that 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 that, that those who give a cleric their powers are you know usually pretty good. Um, but patrons can be neutral, can be can be bad, can be good. You know they're all over the place uh, and usually are, are somewhat chaotic. 
Um, and so Dorian stepped up and said, hey, I'm going to be the arbiter of these deals in my city. Um, I'm going to make sure that young patrons don't lose their souls. Um, I'm going to make sure that that I balance the, the the scales and I act as almost like a lawyer on behalf and a judge and jury on behalf of these young warlocks to make sure that that these 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 you know um, you know this kind these kind of outcasts aren't taken advantage of. And so he balances, mediates, and negotiates every single patron pact in this city and this is a huge metropolitan area um, with people from all across the plains coming here that would a hundred percent weigh on a person's psyche i don't care how how much internal fortitude you have <laughs> you can you can roll 20s all day long and that's that's still going to take its toll and so we see throughout the, the the arc of the story where dorian is kind of accused of this accursed king and and and, and this you know madman but when the players and the party actually meet dorian they find him incredibly composed. They find him in, and this is not, you know, mild spoilers, I guess. It's not that, that much of a spoiler because this happens relatively early on in the story. Um, but they find they find that this this person who's been propped up to be this mad king and this trope really is not. And it, it, it turns this character completely on its head. And then you understand why his psyche is starting to degrade, why his, his, his mentality is starting to fray. And so because of that, we've been able to avoid a lot of the storytelling cliches and, and, and kind of tropey nature of these characters. And that's just for Dorian. And we've done that for all of the main characters, whether it be the Night Captain LaCroix, whether it's um, Fate the Shield Maiden, or Majin the Betrayer. Um, and we, we almost try to have fun with it. I mean, Majin in his title is called the betrayer. I mean, I'll give you one one guess at what Majin tries to do to you, right? But you then find out that it's to whom is he betraying? What does betrayal really look like as a patron? Um, and it, it's on the surface, again, people usually we're so used to whether it's White Wolf or you know D D, all these things. That a lot of them are very cookie cutter. But again. As, as, as a young team of millennials, we're able to stand on the shoulders of these storytelling giants and, and really evolve the practice of storytelling here in 2020 and do something different. Um, and I think that that's why people are resonating with the Kickstarter, why they're really resonating with the project. And we've been able to pass out um, to um, all of our, our, our beta readers and beta testers the entire campaign. And people have played through it from all different um, variations, different levels and different party casts. And we, we always hear back the same thing. No one has ever made anything like this before. Um, and I think that people are gonna be really, really surprised by what they see and what they play through and the experience that they have. Yep. Now, since you mentioned one, you mentioned one of the, pil one of the uh, pillars, the the other one that I did want I did want to ask about is um is fa is fate because give, given the role playing hints in that one when it comes when it comes to that particular character I could see the potential of that of that character becoming a GMPC but um have any ha but um was that something that was ever brought up um internally when right when writing the campaign out. Totally. It, fate, fate's a hard one. So fate, fate has, she, she is, is really ultimately kind of one of our main, you know, main, main, main character. She's with the party for the vast majority of, of the experience. Um, the, um, the way that you put it like a GMPC or like the, the, the GM's character, basically, mm -hmm. um, it can be in a lot of ways if the, if the GM wants to play it that way. Um, another way that a lot of our GMs and, and dungeon masters have played it are instead of having the GM choose, really allowing the players to choose, and that and that fate can react. And we have this throughout for her storytelling tips throughout each act. If your players do this, you have the option of doing this, this, or this. Um, and, and then we say, if you do this, you know, we'll, we'll just to uh, make it easy here for, um, you know, the, the interview, like if they do A, you then have um, one, two and three. If they do B, you have like B, one, two and three. This isn't how we present it. But um, so basically there's like uh, certain categories of options to go. The GM can just be like, we're, I'm, I'm, I'm railroading. We're going this way if they so choose. Um, but we wanted to be able to have player agency really, really, really take part in this almost. And it's not like, it's not 
the exact same because it would be ridiculous. Their book would be like, you know, a thousand pages long, um, but almost like a choose your own adventure a little bit mm -hmm. where the players really can actually have some agency and make some choices. And so if the, so fate, fate a lot of the time says, you know, I, I don't know what, what is the best, you know, the best route and then letting the players choose and then fate kind of then guides them to that, that next location. Um, and if the GM wants to railroad it and they, they, you know, they, they the GM, um, he or she has something very interesting set up. They, they totally can do that. Um, but we really wanted to have it be based on um, really where the players wanted to take their story um, and, and where they were more, most compelling to go, um, you know, within the Shadelands. All right. I can, I can definitely um, get behind that. Now, when it comes to the player end of things, um, you did talk. You did talk a bit. You dipped a bit into uh, subclasses, but one of the things that I do feel I, I do feel that needs to be highlighted is the opportunity for other classes to dip into um, some of the motifs with warlocks. Now, you've hinted at it a few t a few times throughout, but I want to go whole hog into that. So, what can you tell me about how that particular kind of thing is going to is going to work for non warlock um classes totally so I, again, kind of as we addressed previously, a, a lot of times the, the the warlock patron relationship is mm -hmm. exclusively you know exclusively just for the warlock class, and that's a bummer for non non warlocks um and some you know sometimes people just want to try something new and maybe they'd roll roll a, a level one warlock or you know bump it up to level five or whatever they want to do just to kind of try it out but you know I, I'm, I'm not sure about everybody but i know that i get attached to my characters i like them a lot you know they almost become kind of extensions of our our ego persona in a little bit mm -hmm. um and um you know we want to kind of delve into that that patron relationship so again, within within the Shadelands, how we have it from a storytelling perspective, that veil between worlds is very thin. And because of that, any class can touch into that relationship. And even, even more so, that's why Dorian, the Accursed King, acts as an arbiter and acts as, as kind of this, this judge and jury on those deals. And so there are places that you can go into the Shadelands and our, 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 we have quests associated like that, like I had mentioned with, that, with the, the uh, time quest and then another one uh, is for our um, the artist warlock subclass, which is our current um, uh, our current unlockable stretch goal, and, and that one is called the performance in tatters. Um, that that really focuses on more of kind of a, a horror aspect of, of some of our storytelling, um, where people can go and pick up um, these you know these 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 subclasses and pick up these these patron packs, even if they're only temporary, even if it's only during their time in the Shadelands. And that's something that um, the, the the players and the GMs uh, slash DMs will have to kind of explore for their, themselves. Um, we don't want to tell them, "All right, you 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 have a patron now and forever." Um, no, that's not our place to tell you how to run your games. Um, I, I don't like it if someone tries to force me to you know run my games a specific way. We want to give options, right? We want mm -hmm. this to be a, a, a toolkit, um, you know, like a utility kit where you can pull pull awesome you know GM things out of your belt and say, "Now check this out." Um, that's at least for me when I'm a player, um, what interests me the most. Um, and so because of that, people can go, you could have, you could have a character that doesn't touch a patron at all and thinks they're all evil. And, and we've had people play that. And it's really fascinating to like, see that play out. Um, particularly like them, them really joining, you know, joining this underground, uh, this, you know, organized crime network and trying to destroy the city, which is an option. Like you, there, we have a viable ending of this campaign. And this is not a spoiler. This is like anyone who reads the book will see this. And it, it, it is a choice of several um, where you destroy Yonkath. Uh, the entire city gets burned to the ground, and the vast majority of its people are either slain or or repopulate or, or excuse me redistributed across uh, different locations. Um, mm -hmm. That is a viable ending, and, and you could play a, a lawfully good or I don't know lawfully ne you know neutral. I guess I don't know. You're killing a lot of people um, where they say patrons are evil, and we want them all to go away, and we're going to do whatever it takes to make that happen. And they never touch patrons. Um, and they, at least they don't touch them as far as packs are concerned. They may touch them as far as fireballs are concerned. Um, but we then also want to give a, a way for people to take take those patron packs um, 
just to kind of try it on for size and see if they like it. Um, and then they might be like, no, I don't, I don't actually like this, this role playing experience. I want to go back to swinging my sword or, you know, shooting my arrows or setting traps or whatever it is. Um, but they don't know until they try it. And so we've, we've created this playground, this warlock playground for people to, to really just explore and try new things and, and have a good time. Cause ultimately that's what we think, you know, Dungeons and Dragons and Shadowrun and, you know, Pathfinder, all of, really, we're just all just trying to spend, spend, spend some quality quality time with friends um, and and have fun and, and be inspired and, and, and have a good experience. And praying for the mercy of the dice gods. Even oh my give you God. Yes. None. I, I cannot even tell you. I, I swear to God, I, I, I have had to retire certain sets of dice because I just, I swear they're rigged. I mean, I don't understand well, it. I'm thinking of I'm thinking of getting a t-shirt. I'm thinking of getting a t-shirt made that says Jesus says R and Jesus doesn't. <laughs> That's a good one. That's um, a good one. I like it. It's, Admittedly, I had start I had started that whole, that whole T-shirt idea, um, thanks to XCOM. But it'd be a good one. Be a great bumper sticker. Mm -hmm. um, well, if I put it as a bumper sticker, I'd have to explain it all the time. <laughs> At least you might make some new gaming friends, though. Yeah, fair point. Um, now, when now with that with that in mind, um, I think. The uh, preview hinted at a few, hinted at the possibility of new classes. Um, are these, when it comes to these new classes, I'm guessing that some, that some of them will be um, setting specific spins on warlocks, or is there some, or some, there's some other stuff in the uh, proverbial bag. So we have a couple of stretch goals um, that are because uh, so far we've we've unlocked a lot of um, uh, so far, and we're working on our, our next. Uh, our next um, kind of sub subclass, basically, um, and for new fully fledged new classes, um, we're just going to have to kind of release some of that stuff with the stretch goals. Those are a lot harder to manage, um, and there's a lot more that goes into that. Right now, it really is is variations on on a warlock experience. Um, again, this is a warlock city. Uh, something that's not really been explored within the lore before and so we, we have things more focused on the subclass nature we've had people ask us for new fully fledged classes um but uh, we, we we really have leaned towards this 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 warlock theme um and so um there are there's a lot of different ways that we can can go with it again our, our core book is already done it's written it's laid out uh, we have art for it um, now we're just adding adding things on basically and kind of the sky's the limit of where we can go with that um, we have obviously resource and time limitations mm -hmm. um, just from a you know financial perspective of a studio um, but if we can continue to unlock um, these stretch goals uh, we're just reinvesting that money back into the, the core product of this book to better you know the, the gaming environment um, and, and hopefully create this as a pillar for for um you know both players and gms um and and we we envision this as something that you know let's say a gm has never never uh gm'd for a warlock before and someone is like i want to play a warlock and the gm's like oh god okay all right all right cool like great um i've never done that before what do i do if they read this book they will become a proverbial master of warlocks they will be able to run a, war, a warlock and, and create and craft an amazing warlock experience for their player in any setting in any campaign um and there are definitely you know warlock you know warlock themed elements of other stories and other other campaign books you know kind of going back as you'd mentioned to um you know third edition um but we wanted to have everything right there in one place specifically organized together so someone could just read this book and be ready to go um and have it be a resource for folks um and then hopefully tie in some of the elements too even if they don't want to run the campaign in its entirety all of our 10 acts they can draw inspiration and pieces from it throughout everything that they're doing and right, now I'll, I'll definitely be looking forward to, to that now a bit of a a bit of a uh, capstone question that i have is what would you say some of the um learning experiences that you that you've had um since the kickstarter launched yeah david maybe this would be a great because we this is our second kickstarter mm -hmm. um so maybe maybe david you could take it away um you know mm -hmm. before 
before sure. we wrap up the interview and uh, uh, give us give us some of some of your learning, whether it's from an artistic perspective, a crowdfunding perspective, um, on the Kickstarter. Um, not only I think not only the on the Kickstarter, but also on the full the full project. It's it it has been a really huge experience. Um, and I remember when we were before working on on TRO on the Red Opera, we were working on a, a another project, and it was kind of a anecdote and a, a small funny story for me. Uh, I think also for Jameson um, because we we were working on that project for maybe three three months, I guess. I think, um, and uh, Jameson came came to me and it was like. Okay, we we are going to do this 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 D and D book, and and since I I had no idea what it was, it's like, dude, man, like, what what is that? Why why we are doing this? And even today, I tell him, dude, I'm so glad we did this project <laughs> because it brought so much experience in um, every level. Um, since working, learning new software in the production of the book. Uh, Blender was one of them, and it's it's an amazing piece of software. Um, uh, work um, managing, um, working with 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 um, uh, improve the work on, on inside the teamwork was one of the biggest things we had. I think with this project was really learn more working on a teamwork, and especially in these times with the virus, like working everyone each one of us working from home um was really huge uh learning curve uh managing that um even though we we already were doing that now since it was like kind of no you really have to stay home and do this uh it, it, it was really huge um and then on the kickstarter because we've done a previous previously a kickstarter with the last amazon uh, when we started the last Amazon, I think we 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 kind of prepared a Kickstarter a week before launch, maybe two. Yeah, weeks. we were wildly unprepared for our last. Yeah, and and now we were like three months ahead to for the Kickstarter, which was which was a great decision um, and and of preparing, and also that decision came from the experience from the previous Kickstarter. Um, cause we, we were like, okay, like it's, this is like a month for the trailer, another month for, uh, the Kickstarter page, another month to like three months ahead for marketing, for starting getting people excited about the project. Um, and we are still learning a lot of things throughout this, this Kickstarter, um, this Kickstarter campaign for sure. Yeah. I think every day there's. A little bit of something that, oh, okay, I got it, <laughs> you know. Totally, mm -hmm. yeah. And 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 for us as a studio, you know, we're very excited to do more, um, you know, books in fifth edition, um, and maybe focusing on other uh, other classes um, and other settings. Um, but you know, as a studio and as a creative team, we just want to grow 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 with each project that we do. Yeah, exactly. and whether it's you know based on Kickstarter mm -hmm. storytelling art, any of it, the only thing that we can do is continue to evolve and grow and learn as a team um, and, and hopefully be able to bring um, other fellow gamers, um, whether they're, you know, tabletop RPG gamers, uh, video game gamers, or even just people that love great storytelling and art. So people who enjoy, you know, reading great books, looking at amazing art books, um, bring them along with us on that journey and have, you know, really try and bring some light to the darkness of the world and inspire people um, to hopefully, you know, be able to connect with other people um, in, in, you know, fun, geeky passions and um, try to, I know it sounds so trite, but like try to make this broken world a little bit brighter. Exactly. Yeah. Oh, give, given, given my own crusades, I'm not, I'm not going to pass judgment on, on a phrase like that. Um, But um, with now, you get you guys have managed to completely destroy your initial fu your initial um funding goal. In fact, I just saw it update as I'm recording this. Um, 
Now I know I know that um the go that the um end date for it is October first. Um. The the first question that I that I had is um once everything shakes out the way it the way it does after in the days after a Kickstarter finishes, um what are you shooting for as far as a release window? Are you, yeah, are great, you thinking, great question. Um, are you thinking um, December? Or are you thinking early 2021? Yeah, so I uh, so it, it it definitely it definitely won't be 2020. <laughs> um, so I can I can answer that one really quickly. Um, so the reason that we set our stretch or excuse me, we set our initial goal very low was just to cover the the print or the the cost of printing the book. Mm -hmm. So for ten thousand dollars, we could print and ship um, the Red Opera, the core book of the campaign and setting, um, and so. We said, you know what, this is what we need to make this a viable, you know, book out in the ecosystem. Um, that's that. For us, we wanted to make it even better. Um, and it was already clocking in at about 200 plus pages, I think around 220 pages, which is a, you know, solid, solid book, uh, solid, solid campaign and, and setting book. Um, but we really wanted to create the, the, you know, this, this kind of definitive guide to warlocks but to do that um we needed to hit our stretch goals and so we wanted to give the you know give our community that that option of what do you want this to be we already have you know the core book done do you want it to be bigger do you want it to be better do you want it to be more in depth do you want there to be more art you know do you want it to be not just 200 pages do you want it to be you know 250 pages do you want it to be 300 pages we have um, material that we can write and have it not be bloated, but have it actually be useful information to fill a 300 page book. Um, but you know, we got to eat food, man. Like we got, we got families to feed. Mm -hmm. Um, and so we, to, to make that happen, we have to put it in a stretch goals. Now with that said, every stretch goal that we hit requires extra writing, requires extra layout, requires extra work. And it's just going to, it's going to push the date back. And so there's, there's, there's no way as project, you know, um, I'm the, you know, uh, you know, project designer and, and uh, you know, lead creative director that I can say, Oh, it'll be done by this date. Um, it, we don't know how many stretch goals we'll hit. Um, we already have the, you know, 200 pages done and laid out. Um, but if we, you know, add an additional hundred pages, um, it could add, you know, an additional three, four, five months just on our side of production. Um, and then there's manufacturing. We actually have to have the books printed and shipped um, and things like that. So right now in our Kickstarter, where we have it is, I think April, April ish of um, like. So we're looking at like second quarter. Um, uh, you know, uh, you know, kind of late spring, um, potentially early summer 2021 um, for books in hand um, to our backers. Um, that's that's kind of my rough estimation, um, but there's no way to know. But we're working on it diligently every day, full time. So, right. I mean, as, as, as a studio, we're this is, this is all we do. <laughs> well, just just to make just to make sure that I that. I don't end up jinxing things. Look, I've le I've learned not I've learned not to tempt the gods of irony many times over the years. And yet I still make the same mistakes. So, whether so whether or not whether or not knocking on wood will wor will work, I'll leave that up to you. Um, but with that said, I do want to sincerely thank both of you for taking the time out of your um, schedules to co to come onto the show and braving the insanity that is time zones to make to make it up to the temple <laughs> and Thank you. anytime you see fit to return the door is always open and as i often say around here drinking is not mandatory but it is encouraged oh well a well, we hundred percent get behind that um, yeah. and, and 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 i can say you know i can say for for our perspective we you know we all could be doing different things with our lives but we chose to be doing this um, at great personal sacrifice, honestly, mm -hmm. because we love gaming um, and, and not just tabletop role playing, but, you know, we love video games. Um, you know, we love stories and we love being inspired and inspiring other people. And so anytime that we can talk to other like minded um, folks is that's that's time well spent for us. Um, and, and for me, I consider myself so lucky to be able to have you know, be a member of a team where, where we get to do that and share in creativity with David Granjo, with Carlos, with Rick, and with, with, with so many other people in our team. Um, so thank you for giving us the opportunity 
to share our passion with other people. Mm -hmm. And it's de it's definitely one that I'll be look I'll be looking forward to um, in the fu in the uh, future. And and um, I get and I get the feeling given given the given the approach that you've got that um this won't be this won't be the last time I that um. I end up see, I end up seeing this kind of stuff while I'm dig while I'm digging through the trenches as I always do. Oh, a hundred percent. Nor will it be the last time that we are at your at your your beautiful monastery. So thank you. <laughs> my my pleasure. And of course, a sincere thanks to everybody who took the time out of their schedule to enjoy the madness at play here. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is at the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present. My name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody! <laughs>